Good morning, everybody, and welcome again to The Journey. So happy you're here, Pastor Michael Jarbo. We are starting a brand new sermon series today. Are you excited? Because I am. It's going to be so good. The sermon series is entitled Lies We Love. Ooh, good. Good stuff. We're, we're basing it off of a book uh, called Everything Happens for a Reason and Other Lies We Love, written by Kate Bowler. She's a professor at Duke Divinity School. It's an excellent book. I encourage you all to pick up a copy. Uh, find it at Barnes & Noble or on Amazon or wherever you can find books because it is an excellent read, an easy read that really helps to kind of debunk a bunch of the lies that we like to lean on uh, to find some sort of comfort in the midst of them. But the truth is they can do more damage than they can do good. So we have to kind of open them up and see what the real meaning behind what we're saying actually is. Are you ready to journey with me through those? It's going to be an awesome next four weeks. I'm glad that you are here today. If you've got a Bible near you, pick it up uh, or use that app on your phone and turn to 2 Timothy. Whoa, way back at the back. Um, you're going to, if you just, Second Timothy is an awesome book to read. It's short. Uh, it's one of Paul's others to Timothy. Uh, there's two, first and second Timothy. And we're going to be in second Timothy today. And we're going to read chapter four, or, excuse me, chapter three, verses 14 through 17. Let me say that again. That's a mouthful. Second Timothy chapter three, verses 14 through 17. And hear what uh, Paul speaks and says to Timothy today. Again, I'm glad that you're here. Let's do this. Here we go. Verse 14. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. This, my friends, is the word of God for us, the people of God. And together we all say, thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. I must admit, on behalf of all of the pastors here on the staff, that when it comes to new sermon series titles, we like to kind of stir the pot a bit. I mean, again, I think you'd be really maybe intrigued if today's sermon was entitled Thoughts on 2 Timothy 3 by Reverend Michael Jarbo. When a sermon series is called Lies We Love, yeah, there's something that you want to dive in a little bit deeper to. Uh, for one, we all have these lies. And I, I'm sorry, I know some of you are at home shaking your head right now saying, oh, Pastor Jarbo, there, there, there. How could you dare accuse me of having a, a, a lies at all? I'm a good Christian. Well, good doesn't really shield us away from the lies that we're going to be talking about over the next four weeks together, especially because there is a hint of truth in each of them. Plus, they sound simple. They sound even Christian. They sound like things that you could find in the Bible. And we love these lies because they give us momentary comfort. But a lot of times, the misinterpretation of these lies comes with a really messy outcome. These are cliches that seem to lead us in the right direction, but leave us grasping for more. So we are going to debunk them. We're going to name them. We're going to look at them over the next four weeks and ask ourselves, what do they really mean? Where is the real truth just below the surface. You with me? Here we go. Our first lie is this. God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. Now, have you ever heard that phrase used before in your life? Have you ever said that before? This one has direct implications with our relationship with Scripture. It's like the time I convinced my little sister that a jack beats a king in the card game 
War. Yeah, remember the game War? Did you play that? You played it recently? We played it long ago. Remember that game? Yeah, I'm five years older than my little sister, Christina, and I thought that I would teach her a game uh, that was easy when we were younger that we could play together. And the fast learner that Christina is, before I knew it, she was beating me at my own game that I was teaching her. And so I came down to my last card, and her, one of, she had plenty of cards to go, and I had a jack, she had a king of hearts, and she looked at me and kind of smiled, and I declared, I win! And she goes, what? What do you mean? How, how did you win? Are you, are you kidding me? And I swear, I swear to you, I looked at Christina in the eyes and explained an obscure rule that I made up that on the last card, if you play a jack, the jack acts as a spy and takes down any of its competitors in its way. In other words, I'm a terrible older brother. <laughs> Not knowing any better, she conceded, and I slowly began to gain more and more cards after that win until the point came where, well, I actually lost for real that time. You know, I told my sister many, many years after that card game of what I did to her in the game, and it turns out we uh, haven't played the game war much since that time. <laughs> you know, I, I see a comparison in that war experience with how a lot of us has been taught to treat the Holy Scriptures. If it's in the book, as they say, or as if someone with great authority in our lives, or in our eyes at least, claims that it's in there, we believe it. We take it for what it is. And to question and to think critically of the Bible is a big no-no. Don't even think about going there, people have told us in our days. The Bible is to be obeyed, and that settles it. Don't question it at all. If you've ever heard those phrases muttered or shared to you in any part of your life, know that you are not alone. But I think it points to a major disconnect in our relationship with the Holy Scriptures. Let me ask you, start with a question. If you were to describe what the Bible is to you, what would you say? Seriously, what would you say? How would you describe it? Would you say it's a cheat sheet, a life hack to get you through and give you some answers along the way? Is it a road map that you're supposed to read and follow every single direction it tells you? Is it an ancient text with magical powers? Is it only important in the New Testament because the Old Testament doesn't have any Jesus in it, so who cares about that part? I'm, I'm, a, I'm a New Testament kind of Christian, yeah. Or I think we sometimes make it exactly what it needs to be just for us and for no one else. And there's a problem in that too. See, friends, the truth is I think the first step in debunking this Christian lie <laughs> that sometimes we love is we need to define our relationship with the Holy Scriptures. And if you're interested in doing that, start here with this line. The Bible is still speaking to us. It's not some dead text that should be read solely for history. Now, yes, it's got plenty of history in its great words, and we have to be mindful of them. We have to be careful to not take the Bible out of context. But the words of Scripture are still a living document that can mold and shape us. I love in C.S. Lewis's book, The Screw Tape Letters. Got to read that one. This is a story of this a demon named Screwtape, and he's giving all of these lessons to his nephew, Wormwood, about how best to stifle a young, budding Christian into sure disaster. And one of Screwtape's final reminders paints this very eerie reality. He writes this to his nephew. He says, Indeed, my nephew, always remember the safest road to hell is the gradual one. 
the gentle slope, soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts. You see, the fear here is that the Christian diverts off the path of mindlessness into a place of theological contemplation and reflection. Basically, evil does not want us questioning things. Rather, us to just stay uninformed and lifeless. And so the truth is we have to keep this document living. We have to keep it alive. We have to keep a working relationship with the biblical text. Paul gives his best effort. He tries here in the scripture we read today. He says, all scripture is inspired by God, or as our translation read, all scripture is God breathed. The Greek there is theonuestros, which means God inspired or God's breath poured out. But where? We don't think of the Bible the way Muslims think of the Quran, which is completely dictated directly by God. Paul doesn't say all scripture of God is dictated. And, and, and let me tell you, if you see a Bible that says that, you might want to turn and run away. The Bible does have a human element to it. God inspired, guiding those writing, but they have human parts to them. It's, they're humans doing their best to write the Bible. Inevitably, in, inevitably, they had choices that they had to make. And the question comes, what if they made mistakes? You know, historical mistakes. <laughs> are interesting, aren't they? Think about it. People would say, oh, that invalidates the Bible if it's humans writing it. No way. But does it really? It makes me think of a story I've shared once before here at The Journey about my friend Mark's 40th birthday. I was in college. He was the young adult director at the church that I was uh, going to, and uh, we scrapped together all of our uh, money to buy balloons and pizza and cupcakes, a homemade sign, the whole deal. And uh, we were eating pizza, and Mark spoke up, and he looked at the crowd that was there, and he's like, hey, I just got to ask, why are y'all going to such trouble <laughs> to throw me such a birthday like this? And we looked around, and I said, Mark, it's your 40th birthday, dude. This is awesome. And he looked at us, and he goes, I'm 39. And we all awkwardly like looked everywhere and then just started dying laughing anyways. Now, you could say, oh, Mine and Mark's relationship is invalidated because we had the wrong date. Party over, done, everything is over. But I actually think it's a little endearing. It's like the Bible. So some of the verses contradict each other. We read about some things that God does in the Old Testament, and it feels like they're different than things that God does in the New Testament. Or have you ever wondered, like, why are there four different Gospels? They say a lot of the same thing, but not everything the same. Why are there four different accounts of the same story? I, it doesn't make sense sometimes. It doesn't make sense that the Bible, it doesn't make sense that the Bible is any kind of less authoritative or meaningful. When I think about the Bible in that way, with all those different ways and lenses they're looking at it, I, I like to think the Bible is more approachable. The Bible is kind of messy. That means there's, a, there's room for me in the story. The families, the characters, the stories that are all described in Scripture aren't polished. They aren't perfect. They're kooky and dysfunctional. And I like that. That means that there's room for you and for me and for all of our messiness too. I've also been asked before, uh, if we should take the Bible literally or not. Most recently, before COVID, a new family in the community asked to go take me out for a cup of coffee to get to know me. And they always said they want to discuss some things about the church. I'm, I'm almost positive when people say I want to discuss some things about the church, it's code for I want to know your theology. <laughs> Give me the goods. <laughs> and I went and sat with them. And it was not like that for most of the time. I mean, this was a real honest, caring, loving family. And it was incredible for them to share what God had done with them 
even in the midst of the heartache of their lives. And uh, the wife of the family, who is a, who's a doctor in the medical center downtown, looked at me and said, oh yeah, I, but I do have one more thing to ask. Do, do you believe that the Bible is all true or just a, a big metaphor that we can all live life better by? Please, I, I got to know your thoughts. And I know in the medical field, there's not a lot of room for black and white uh, uh, because that's all, excuse me, there's only room for black and white when you're in the medical room or doing a procedure. And so I don't think she really loved perhaps my answer I gave her, but I looked her in the eyes and I said, well, truthfully, it's both. And it's easier to tell the difference than you think. I began going into the story uh, about when me and my siblings were younger, my dad would always come in late at night and would read to us at our bed. And we were in the thick of E.B. Webb's, um, Char- excuse me, E.B. White's Charlotte's Web. Do you know the book? Yeah, or maybe even seen the movie. Um, when it gets to that part where the lovable pig Wilbur looks to Charlotte and hears her utter her very last breath before she peacefully dies. I, that moment sticks out from my childhood. I remember like tears, like hearing tears in my dad's like voice and, and then on my face, Charlotte, whom we had grown to love, this heartwarming motherly character had died and we were sad. Next week, my great uncle Charlie passed away. He would always sing old hymns and walk around on his walker and dance with us when we go to his house in Florida to see my dad's family. My dad came in again around the bedtime to share with us the news, and we cried more. But, you know, we fully understood the difference between the two things happening. One was a fictional spider told through somebody's wonderful imagination and in a book that we cherish, and the other was a real person The Bible is filled with both fiction and nonfiction, all trying to direct us more towards God. The Bible is also very, very holy and very, very human and deep and complex and truthfully can be a little intimidating at times. Am I right there? Have you ever been intimidated by what you've read in the Bible? Go read Revelation. Yeah, take that in. But I believe The Bible is also understandable. A common claim in our Methodist tradition is that the Bible holds everything necessary for salvation. It's kind of a broad definition, but it's a good one. God's revelation is not rare or archaic. The scriptures are not made of stone. It has life and it gives us ours. What God is doing through us and what God promises us and what God expects of us all is fully revealed in these holy scriptures. The Bible is understandable because God is not done speaking through its words. We're all guilty at some point of being too focused on the nature of scripture as if like the word inspired is sort of this like radioactive, holy untouchability. No, guys, through the scripture, God reaches down and offers us a holy word to be, as Paul says, to be used for teaching. How good of God to give us a book, actually a whole library of books, if you think about it, for a lifetime of learning about God and learning about ourselves. If it was perfect, how would we begin to see ourselves in its pages? Paul also says that the scripture is also to be used for rebuking and correcting. Ouch. Hoping Paul wouldn't go there with that one. Um, There's this cartoon uh, that I love that was posted on my favorite theology professor's door Uh, It's from Charles Schultz, uh, the writer who does the Peanuts comics. Uh, And there's this young man, uh, and he's sitting there reading his Bible uh, intently. His girlfriend walks over to him to get his attention, but he waves her off and he says, don't bother me. I'm looking for a verse 
of Scripture to back up one of my preconceived notions. Ooh, awkward. No rebuking or correcting going on when we hunt through scriptures to find something to back up one of our ideas about life or our thoughts on God. Cherry-picking verses, as we call it sometimes, for personal protection or agenda will bring about trouble, friends. And sometimes it can be downright abusive when people use it. And in the next few weeks, especially as political tensions raise, rise up, People in political power are going to be grabbing for verses to help bring and validate themselves as a candidate. And friends, I want you to watch out for this. All scripture is to be read and interpreted within the thrust of all scripture, never to be cherry picked and read alone. I think that's at the heart of this lie we love. This lie we love. God said it. I believe it. And that settles it. (laughs) We lean into those words the most in our life, the words of Scripture, when we want God to bail us out. Or at its worst, we want the Scripture to be a crutch to lean on to accomplish my needs. I remember for college graduation, I was given uh, a Bible from a family member, and uh, the Bible was translated and comp- uh, put together by a prominent uh, minister down here in the South. And I was happy to receive it, especially about to head off the seminary in Chicago. But what I quickly realized is that this translation looked a lot different than the other translations of the Bible I, I had. I- instead of Jesus' words in red. Have you ever heard that? You know, some Bibles, all of Jesus' words will be in red so you can know when Jesus is speaking, especially there in uh, the Gospels. Uh, The pastor who did the commentary for the Bible put all of his words in red outside the lines near the Bible. Ew. Ew. If that feels icky to any of you through the screen, it's because it is and was and will forever be icky. So hear this today, friends. When the main character of the Bible becomes you, you've got it all wrong. The Bible isn't good news for just you. It's good news for everyone. And the main character, don't forget it, is always Jesus. Our task as reading Scripture should be to constantly check ourselves before we wreck ourselves. We need to be asking ourselves, when I'm reading this Scripture today, when I'm reading this this chapter of the Bible, am I reading it to challenge me? Am I reading it to push me, to, 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 to make me, to stretch me, to make me a better contributor to God's kingdom? Or is it just agreeing with everything I already believe? Are we looking at Scripture to suit my needs, to suit my notions? It's going to hurt. To paint an image of my God? That looks a lot. Actually, exactly like me? You know, people ask me, especially non-religious people, they ask me a lot, uh, Michael, how do you find it in you to preach the good news in times like these, in times of difficulty, in times of sadness? And I say to them, it's because I, I try to keep at the forefront of my mind a long time ago, God breathed on people, messy, broken, miserably lacking people like you and like me to give us words to remind us all that we are indeed redeemable. God's very project was to save us, to become one of us, to become a poor no-name guy from out in the middle of nowhere who recruited some followers who ultimately failed him who was accused of partying too hard, who was accused of uh, carousing with the wrong people, wrong types of people that people were supposed to see, 
speaking wrongfully to church folk. And because of it, he was killed. He died a brutal criminal death on the cross, a shameful showing for a sad human being, much less God Almighty. And then God does it again. He makes what looks to be hopeless. And last week's news and turns it into the greatest story ever told. A story of light. A story of peace. A story of hope. A story of love. A story of resurrection. This is God's story, which frames my and your story, not the other way around. And it really is a stunningly beautiful thing. But one question still remains, is what chance does this Bible have in a cynical, pluralistic, depressed era like the one we inhabit today? And the quick answer is none, if we read it just to get our point across. Really, in reading the Bible, I think we miss so many possibilities when all we ask time and time again is, is this relevant for my life? Instead, we should assume the stance of those who have come before us in the faith and ask with openness, O oh God, speak, for your servant is listening. What might happen then? You know, I've found that rarely, if ever, does the Bible cooperate with our search for quick, easy answers or clear, simple ideas of God. So to truly debunk this lie we love, don't let this holy text get stale. God is still speaking through these ancient words. Let it live within you, grow in you, expand yourself to ask more questions than only seeking answers. Perhaps, the more I think about it, it's not defining our relationship with the Bible we need to do first, but to find our relationship with God, who through the Son and through the Spirit helps to point the emphasis always away from our own desires and agendas and towards a greater message for all. So whether you wear scrubs or a suit to work every day, you're a skeptic or a self-proclaimed saint, a lifelong Methodist, or you're a brother still seeking forgiveness for a card game lie. Never stop asking. Never stop speaking. Never stop studying. Never stop reading. And never stop being taught about the goodness of this scripture. Let God rule in your heart and let that word be fresh about you every day. Because the truth is, brothers and sisters, that there is good news for everyone in this book. Might we see it, might we believe it, and may it be so. Amen.